And today we're going to build this floating L desk for my music room. So we moved into this house about a year ago and a lot of the weekend uh, time since has gone into making this workshop as functional as we can get it. Which now means I have the capacity to start working on some of the projects inside the house. The first two of which are the music room and the home office. And my plan is to get some workable desk space in the music room, which is what you're gonna see in this video, and then pick the things up from the, the main office, move them over so I have a temporary office in the music room, and then work on the desk in, and uh, shelving and that kind of thing in the main office. In pursuit of that, I abandoned what was sort of a, a much more complicated design uh, using uh, hardwood flooring planks and some of that to make a desk, and instead went with something very, very simple and something that I think you will enjoy uh, as a project if you decided to tackle it as well, which is to use pre-made but unfinished butcher block birch in this case. Birch was considerably cheaper than the walnut or any of the other hardwoods. Those countertops stained and finished and then mounted on heavy duty shelf brackets directly to the wall and uh, uh, lag bolted into the studs so there's a good support. The brackets that we chose are rated for a thousand pounds a pair, more than adequate for what we were doing with the, de with the desk purpose. And the stain that we used was a, a walnut. I wanted sort of that dark look, but actual walnut was two or three times as expensive as this birch was. And that meant that I could basically do both desks in the rooms using this technique that I'm about to show you versus doing one of them for the same budget. And all things being equal, the price of a project often does matter for prioritizing and deciding how we do things. So uh, with that, let's get started and I'll show you the process, what we all did, the materials we used. Links are down in the, will be down in the description for where to get the actual brackets and the uh, countertops that I used in particular. They were from Home Depot. And with that, we'll get going. So I started off by uh, getting some wood filler and filling in the knots and other various cracks. This countertop was actually designed for the other side to be the side that you're facing up. So all of the imperfections are flipped over to this back side. It turned out though, when I was looking at it, that I preferred the, this side. I like a little bit more imperfection in what I work on. So filled each spot, scraped uh, smooth with the putty knife and let that dry. although I inevitably found more spots that I should have putty filled later. I then sanded with 80 grit, 120 grit, and then 220 to get the surface as smooth as I could get it uh, in a reasonable amount of time. Always wear your dust mask and always use your filtration. Ended up nice and smooth. Um, you can see there's a lot of character to what the manufacturer considers the flaws of this, and I really like that in the way this desk turned out. So then I took some dark walnut, uh, Varathane wood stain, and this is the brand that I use for all of my stains. It covers really well, one coat. Uh, you can overlap it, which I'll show you here in a minute how, how well that works versus some other brands that I've used in the past. But I went with a dark walnut. There'll be contrasting white painted items in this music room, and so this dark surface with then white cabinets underneath is what we'll end up with. Used a couple of shop towels. Sometimes I use actual old t-shirts or that kind of thing, but I regularly use these for staining. And I take one and fold it and fold it again and again until I've got something that sort of fits nicely in between, uh, in, between in the palm of your hand. And then the other I set aside for wiping up the excess, which we'll show here in a second. So dip the pad that I've effectively made in the stain and then smear it on. And the thing with, particularly with this Varathane stain is you really can't overdo it. The wood will only absorb so much of it and you can see it absorbs it fairly quickly, but it won't really over absorb it. So you can kind of be um, pretty liberal with putting it on, especially if you're okay with you know not stretching every last uh, drop of it as far as possible. Rub it on. 
make sure you get a complete coat. You can see streaking if you don't get a complete coat. And then I wipe off the excess um, or smear the excess around. If you're worried about it getting too much, then clearing up the excess makes a difference. Now you see here, there's a spot where I left it open and a lot of people will be worried that you might by going over that edge again, that you're gonna see the line and you're gonna see where, where you stained twice and it's too dark. And I did this mostly to show you that you can go over this area, over the edges, even over the area you've already stained with stain pretty aggressively. And then when I wipe it clear, you won't see where the edge was of that area in the middle that I left unstained. You can see it absorbing fairly quickly again, and then I will wipe off the excess and you will not see the seam at all. See, it looks great. Some people might consider this blotchy, but I actually like that overall imperfect, not consistent variability in the grain, in the stain, and I like the look of this. Uh, your aesthetics are up to you. So once I had that all stained on all six sides, I got out some water-based polyurethane. I, um, I like this in particular because it's super easy to clean up. It dries really quickly, so you can put multiple coats on. Uh, like on a Saturday, I've put as many as six or eight coats on from early in the morning until in the in the evening, sanding in between each coat without any difficulty. And it turns out that this finish, when uh, we follow up with the buffing that we're going to do with some, some steel wool and some other things like that, that you end up with this really lustrous matte finish or semi- uh, not really a, a flat matte, but a little bit of a satin, and it gives you the look of a little bit of age, a little bit of wear, and avoids that glossy plastic look that almost everybody associates with polyurethane. And it's become one of my one of my favorite finishes for anything that that I really want actually protected by, by polyurethane. And as much as I would like to pretend that I don't spill things on my desks, I uh, almost always spill things on my desk, and I did want this music desk protected from spills as well as from dings and dents. Um, although I, I've already said, I, I don't mind dings and dents in furniture. I think it adds character and I like the way that looks. Um, I also did not go out of my way to damage it on purpose. All right. So we stirred that up. You do need to make sure that it's consistent and not, uh, different shades of, of thickness or different shades of white. So apply this with a brush in part because I'm basically going to be buffing out any brush, brush strokes with the, the abrasive that we're gonna be using following it up. You want kind of as thin a coat as you can get on with it being a complete coat. Uh, use a synthetic brush here, which is generally what I use with this stuff. You can also use a foam brush and you'll get fewer brush strokes. I uh, didn't have any foam brushes around and I did some of this stuff without wanting to go to the hardware store in between. So I just used the brushes I had on hand. You can see it does bring out the grain a little bit. Uh, a lot of times people will say that water brush polyurethane does not bring up, does not highlight the grain at all, but you can see that when it's wet, it does in fact bring that up and retains that up until we sort of knock back the shine that this finish, this is, uh, satin polyurethane and if you just left it you'll see you do have a little bit of a, a gloss to it uh, between coats I put my brush in a Ziploc bag and zip it up nice and tight and then it doesn't need to be washed out in between coats and you can just reuse it so then I went to the steel wool bin which contains regular steel wool in this case uh, quad zero which is basically the finest grade you'll see regularly available in places like the big box stores what I really prefer are these 3M ultra fine sanding pads and I've got them in a gray, a sort of a maroon and a white, which are actually the, the sequence that I tend to use them when I have them available. But the steel wool alone will, will work as you work coat after coat. So you basically just smooth it down and then uh, I switched over to the pads because that's what I actually prefer. But I did want to show you that the steel wool does knock it down. 
And you basically buff until you can get it as smooth as you can possibly get it on the current coat that you're on. This does take, and I generally go by touch because what I really like about this finish is how it feels. It uh, feels much closer to the wood. You can actually feel the grain when we're done with this, even with three coats of polyurethane on. And I've done this with as much as eight or 10 coats, and it still feels much closer to the wood than most polyurethane does. So I would basically do the sequence of the gray, then this maroon, I didn't film the white. But what you wanna make sure is happening is that some of the polyurethane is coming up as white powder. If not, you didn't let it dry enough or you're not pushing enough to actually make a difference. So after three coats, sanding like that in between, this is what I ended up with. So we went inside to the corner where this desk is gonna be installed and we marked off our height line. We determined this height line by measuring uh, in my office chair, the height at the height that I like to sit at, the height that um, the armrests were at, so it's level with that, which is a tiny bit higher than a lot of people are used to for a desk. We then took a level to do plumb and marked out where the studs were, so we used a stud finder to find them, and then marked out where our studs were going for our brackets. These brackets are going to mount directly into the structure of the wall, which is what you have to do if you're going to do a desk like this. You can use those little anchors for things like curtain rods and hanging, hanging pictures, but if you're going to put an actual desk anchor to the wall, it absolutely has to be connected to the studs. And In this case, we did so with heavy-duty lag bolts, although uh, we did have to adjust our process after this first one. Uh, you'll see here in a minute. So we lined those up, we marked where the holes needed to be drilled with a pencil. And we're gonna pre-drill those out in all the way into the stud so that with the lag bolts will go in without any uh, significant difficulty. Now I've been mounting things like TVs in this house with lag bolts and, and several other things with lag bolts and use the impact driver to tighten them all the way. However, the lag bolts we bought for this project seem to be, uh, near as we can tell, just lighter duty. And so we actually ended up in this on this first bracket here over tightening them, which is here in a minute. But drill all three holes, then attach the bracket with an impact driver and we broke lag bolts in the process. So what you wanna do is, uh, well, we adjusted all of our holes up a half an inch because we had already drilled uh, before we started breaking bolts and we ended up breaking more than one. So you get them so that they're still a little bit loose and then you tighten them down with a ratchet wrench uh, manually and then you won't break any. So we set the top on and put a three quarter piece of wood at each spot where it touches the wall to give a little bit of a room to be able to tuck like USB cables through and that sort of thing. And then from underneath, we used wood screws. These were one and a quarter inch wood screws to attach the, the top to the brackets. Now you'll see if you looked at that corner that there was a little bit of a height discrepancy um, that we wanted to adjust. So we, we grabbed a one by four and we made sort of a gusset here that we're gonna to attach to one side first and then we're effectively going to hand clamp. We could have used regular clamps, but we just did it with the two of us. Uh, with Aaron down below, actually attaching the gusset directly to the top. And you can't see this unless you climb underneath there. You can't see it when you're sitting near it, and you can't see it standing in the room. So we attached one side completely with plenty of screws. And like I say, these are one quarter, one and a quarter inch screws for a one and a half inch surface. And now you'll see the discrepancy there that we're trying to adjust for. So we clamped on hands on both sides, squared it up, got it exactly where we wanted it. And then Aaron attached the other side from underneath. Which, was, uh, which we did then before attaching the brackets to that second side.
and here you have the final product. We set it up, uh, sort of staged it with uh, some of the music equipment that'll be there, a uh, laptop, a uh, monitor, microphone with recording shield, uh, acoustic panel thing. Um, pretty happy with how this thing turned out. It's uh, a nice floating desk, I can tuck things underneath, and the project wasn't too expensive. So the six foot countertop, which is the longer one, was $169. The four foot countertop was 98. The brackets were $8 a piece. We used four of them for a total of $299 plus uh, stain and finish and some of the things which I already had on hand and uh, bolts and screws and that sort of thing. So with that, I uh, hope you enjoyed this project and give it a shot. Sign up for the newsletter at obscurityworks.email. Check us out uh, at the various other places and we'll see you next time.